Current species population argument. I see people spending a lot of time arguing about evolution and uh, we know that certain things do happen that people call evolution. I, I tend to call them adaptation because I believe God created the DNA so that it would have various electrochemically favorable changes. And that's a very important term that I'm going to use a few times here. Electrochemically favorable changes that uh, can occur and uh, just conveniently cause a, a beak to grow longer on a bird, for instance, uh, to make it so that it can adapt to an environment where it needs that. Whereas uh, one where it's in a different environment, it may be more efficient for it to have a shorter beak and it'll uh, put back into that environment because it's an electrochemically favorable change. Uh, it will flop right back and some of them will start having shorter beaks and those will persist and in that case sure uh, the uh, theory of uh, evolution uh, basically plays out however uh, evolution between species is ludicrous and we're going to see why today between uh, complex species now we see the one instance of lizards around the lake and I drew this I said this looks like a fist I, I'm not a very good artist I was uh, going to try to draw some kind of lizard head there. Oh, I am a happy lizard here and I came from my ancestor who was a not as happy lizard. <coughs> Poor Liz. And um, <clears throat> this guy um, wasn't quite as adept for a particular environment maybe. So this other uh, species spawned here. Now we assume it's a species. They, I don't know if they've really been able to check whether these things can, may, how do you, how do you check whether a lizard just doesn't like the smell of a previous, you know, <laughs> there may be some uh, thing that is causing it to be driven away from the previous uh, species. It may be that they absolutely have compatible DNA, but it just isn't known. So I don't know how far they've taken that experiment. It sounds like something out of the far side in order to do an actual <laughs> test for that. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> so here, you know, what's going to happen here? We've got a case where this lizard uh, species has uh, propagated now another species that is probably itself going to proliferate. And if this one's probably going to continue to proliferate in its environment, they're both going to happily proliferate. And you're going to look later and say, oh, look, there's two similar but not quite identical species uh, that don't mate with each other. Okay, maybe. We're best case scenario, that's what you've got. Now, the thing is, that actually works to uh, quench the thought that uh, genetic drift is the mechanism by which uh, evolution between complex species happen or from you know simple cell to more complex species. Um, up here I've pictured you know a chain of many 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 segments millions of segments of slow gradual changes are happening and the supposedly the the uh, due to survival of the fittest uh, natural selection as they call it. Due to this uh, effect, uh, these are going to die off and these are going to, you know, proliferate. Well, there's a distinct problem here and let's take a small uh, segment of this and look closer up at it. Within this segment, it's like, you know, Lizzie's here, there are going to be changes that are going to be electrochemically favorable and they, they may even cause at some point a change where it won't mate with the other thing. That, that could happen, you know, but they're still, they don't have different organ systems substantially. There, there aren't, you know, very complex changes that took place. A change that uh, is invoked that causes something not to want to mate with the prior species or not be able to is not necessarily a very complex change in the DNA. So within this structure, and who knows, this thing at some time may spawn a species that goes right back and can mate with those. You know, it's uh, very possible. It isn't necessarily going to go down some chain here. But anyway, so within this genetic space, you've got a lot of electrochemically favorable changes I've drawn within this envelope. Uh, there is, is all this activity uh, that this, ge this initial genetic structure here can change over to another genetic structure that's over here or over here. And, you know, there's a lot of possibilities within this framework where they are electrochemically favorable change. Once you start having changes that go outside of that boundary, then we start seeing 
these are caused by um, higher energy interactions. They're caused by uh, a high energy electromagnetic radiation smacking into the DNA during a critical time. This uh, thing that results is not in our observation ever a favorable thing. Okay, let's go uh, back here because that is not the crux of my argument today. It's a side tour, but anyway, uh, the important thing to realize is that we do observe, you know, electrochemically favorable changes that happen, and they can cause minor changes in the thing. They never have been observed to cause extensive changes where your entire metabolism changes or the the whole, uh, you know, organ system changes in a in a being. So. We've got that going on, changes outside, death, infertility, bad things, uh, birth defects, those kind of things. That's always, if you read any medical site, they'll tell you 100% of the time when you have these uh, mutations caused by x-rays or this kind of thing, it's always something bad, okay? High energy ones are not good. And that's because uh, the designer created it so this molecule has a, a bandwidth of things that can change due to environment, normal situations, and you didn't in, initially intend even high energy radiation to be in the picture, I believe. There was a firmament, but anyway. Back to our uh, crux of the argument here. So each of these segments, you know, has this thing going on where there are a lot of possibilities in genetic space for things to go this direction, that direction. And what I'm saying is, if you have a chain millions long, it ain't going to be linear, baby. It's going to go all different directions. It's going to go, you know, you're going to have things shooting off every which direction uh, and going for some length they may not go very far and as we observe things don't go very far they stay right in here or there's death and infertility so that's all the more uh, uh, of a testimony that if these chains did exist they would be short mostly if I'm using inductive reasoning here evolutionists are claiming okay follow me they're claiming so I'm using inductive reasoning I'm saying Let's say your claim is true, boys and girls, okay? All you hyper-intellects out there that think you understand this, listen to me. This is something you've completely missed, apparently. Because if, statistically speaking, you had a chain millions long, it isn't going to be just a straight line, okay? It's going to go, it's going to have stuff taken off, and some of them won't. Some of them might just go to the next one and then orphan. But statistically speaking, you're going to have a lot of them that go off for some distance in genetic space that there's so many ways to go. You're going to have some of them that go 3, 4, 20 different directions if it's possible to go a million in one direction, okay? That's what I'm saying. There's no statistical reason that it should be more likely that it just goes in a chain. That <laughs> this is very, very simple, and I don't know why this argument has been overlooked by most of the academic community, but perhaps it's because they have tunnel vision and they can't see beyond their own, you know, they're, they're, most of these people live in fear. They're afraid of losing their grant. If they started talking about something like this, they'd be thrown out probably. They figure people would go talk to the people that are funding them and they'd get their grant removed. Well, I don't have a grant and I can speak the truth. And the truth is, if you had a million long chain, you'd have all kinds of different directions coming off of a lot of these segments in the chain, okay? And uh, as you get closer and closer to human from whatever our, our common ancestor here is, see a common ancestor human over here, okay, let's say millions in here and we're amplifying and looking at a segment of the chain near the human population, you would have had, you know, have these thousand, you know, segments here that are all fairly human-like by that point. There's just minor changes happening in each segment, okay? You would have all kinds of chains going off here and different things, and these wouldn't go very far perhaps and they would be called leaves on the branch essentially they would form very quickly a, a population that just sat there and it didn't have really anywhere to go but back you could go back to there but because of what genetic space is it's a code a very complex code that uh, describes the development of a living being and so you don't necessarily have a line where you can just keep going and going and going eventually something gets out of sync with something else and you simply wind up with a non-viable piece of DNA that cannot create a living being. So uh, there seem to be safeguards against that since pretty much every human that uh, is born tends to uh, live on average. You know, it's, it's pretty much a favorable thing. It isn't a rare thing for a human to live. So 
or any other creature. <clears throat> uh, but uh, anyway, so we've got this uh, likelihood that there would have been thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of offshoots within near human genetic space, you know, things that went some distance and then continue to propagate as a species because that's what species tend to do. They don't tend to, if they go far enough to where they can spawn something else, they don't tend to shrink back and disappear. They tend to go on. They don't tend to just uh, become extinct. The, the reason they proliferated in the first place is because they had some attributes that were capable of coping with the environment. Uh, survival of the fittest does not mean extinction of the less fit. Very important to realize that, okay? You cannot say that just because something wasn't as apt to do something that it's going to... No, 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 no. Things deal with all kinds of inferior characteristics and they still proliferate as a species. Sometimes better just because they tend to just, you know, do that all the time. Anyway, but uh, <laughs> a lot of variables, a lot of variables at play. So anyway, this uh, is not what we observe in the fossil record, and it's not what we observe in the current species population. Okay, we observe one human-like character. There is nothing that looks remotely human-like. Uh, an ape, it's billions and billions of changes between us and an ape. Okay, they're not, they're not that similar. We have uh, similar uh, basic formation, a head, limbs, you know. <laughs> But, you know, that could testify of one of two things. It can testify of a creator who used common macros to create the things. And he was, as an intelligent programmer, I've done, you know, C language and, and uh, assembler language in uh, various applications. And you use macros if you're intelligent. You don't repeat all your efforts. It's pointless, especially when you have infinite memory in which to, <laughs> you know, on the genetic code. The 10 to the 260th combination possibilities in a simple cell, 10 to over the 1,000th possibilities of arrangement in a human gene. So you, you've uh, or the DNA, and uh, so yeah, you've got uh, just a, a very, very, very uh, closed argument here. Uh, statistically speaking, we should see thousands of things still proliferating, not even in the fossil record. In the fossil record, we'd see a lot more, obviously. Uh, people say, well, fossils are rare. Yeah, yeah, but we see, you know, a lot of certain kinds of things in the fossil record. Uh, but ignore the fossil record. It's not important because living right here among us should be all kinds of things where, you know, people find out, oh, gee, I can't mate with that thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, it doesn't happen that way. Every human on the planet is uh, compatible uh, pretty much, as far as I know. I don't think there are any near-human uh, species here that uh, are not human. I think everything that looks like a human is a human, and uh, God created us as a people who are completely compatible in that way. Now, um, if you uh, want to take this to a peer review board for me, I would appreciate it because I found that most people just turn a deaf ear to things that, that violate the current status quo. In fact, I was thrown off the physics forum for discussing non-mainstream theories. How kooky can it get? <laughs> I mean, I can't even talk to people on a silly physics forum on the internet about, I asked for data on, uh, this had to do with the Big Bang, and I'll try to do a video of that someday, uh, discuss the reasons why I don't believe the Big Bang happened, and it has to do with blue shift in our local system here and uh, evaluating the actual velocities of galaxies. But anyway, let's uh, not get into that today. That pretty much concludes the current species population argument. And uh, now I won't have to say this over and over when people ask about this on the Internet all the time. I get tired of just repeating myself. So, <laughs> But yeah, absolutely bring this to people who uh, are on peer review boards and show it to them and ask them to uh, explain what is wrong with this theory to you. Alrighty, have a good day. <clears throat>